we have on our panel a uh, distinguished artist from the country krishan khanna ji sheba chachi and shuddhar bata sen gupta as you all know uh, the the subject of our discussion this evening is art in the times of dislocation migration responses and responsibilities so what we wish to discuss today is how have artist community responded to all these uh, events which have taken place over the years we we are all aware that uh, be it the rulers kings or feudals or politicians they are all power hungry or they want to kind of usurp others lands or ge geographical spaces and control over people and with that have been there there have been wars and there have been all kinds of things happening so as a result the ordinary people have suffered so here a lot of destruction takes place a lot of people get displaced they have to migrate to the places they don't wish to after that where does art and culture come in what kind of a role art and culture can play or does play or has played over the over the years so we have uh, if you go do not go that far back into history if we go back to the last century like the 20th century we have the spanish flu we have two world wars we have uh, partition of india and pakistan then partition of pakistan once again into you know Beng uh, west Beng sorry bangladesh and west pakistan then we in between had the holocaust we've had the you know korea being divided then the syrian crisis now recently the latest pandemic which has caused uh, which i think all panelists would agree a man made kind of a crisis in which millions of people are forced to migrate to uh, their states uh, respective you know states they belong to which is something which probably could have been avoided so what we'll do tonight is our panelists will begin with krishn khanna ji then shiva chachi then shudhabrata sen gupta so my question to them would be how has artistic community be it musicians be it you know writers painters poets filmmakers theater person how have they responded to these kind of we have a uh, like in india we take the example of partition of india in 1947 Uh, the responses have been like Manto, for instance, was a very good example of writing short stories. Then we have Amrita Pritham writing that very famous uh, poem "Aja Kham Bari Shanu." Then we have uh, films uh, like we have that uh, uh, you know uh, the the one which comes to my mind is uh, "Garam Hawa," then "Tapas," then uh, "Tamash." Sorry, then uh, "Train to Pakistan," and there's one more film that Shuddha Brata would correct me. Uh, which was made much earlier in 1961 and painters have also responded and during the partition period krishna kanna is, is is the one who has actually experienced partition along with the sish gujral pranath mago and many others in bengal in other parts of the country so let's begin with krishna kanna ji is about his experiences and then sheba then uh, shuddha then we can move on to the next session each one will have 5 minutes each then we will have the second session krishan ji yeah i'm ready yeah please start oh well i mean you know my history with uh, these migrations and so on goes back even further and it begins with the last war for instance when the war broke out um, i happened to be on the east coast at that time and uh, it was expected that the germans would start bombing and bombing very fast and in, indeed the blitz, the blitzkrieg did happen but uh, having that in mind what the government did was they uh, since the young generations schools were shut school children were sent out arrangements were made with people who were living outside of right outside of london in the countryside and the kids went now this is all i can't can't have the time to sort of tell you what arrangements were made but i was personally i was 14 years old then and i was told to meet a train and meet some people there and then take them to a house where these kids were going to be kept in that family now you know 
looking at our situation, which is much bigger in a sense. Of course, the Blitzkrieg did happen. People did get killed and it was a pretty awful thing. But at the same time, I think we have had, uh, I mean, the enormity of this uh, thing has never been experienced the world over. You know? But it amazes me that one never even foresaw this situation. And we put a clamp down, which is okay, but then the ancillaries that follow uh, were not not taken into account whatsoever. And so people, there were a lot of, there's a lot of damage which has been done as a result, you know, which could have been avoided, in my opinion, you know. Uh, however, going back to the partition, I will say that in times of stress, such as the partition had, I lost a job in, Lah in Lahore. I went on seven days leave. I was in a printing press and I was uh, coming back. I was in a managerial position in the printing press after having served two years as a, a learning the job as it was on, on the machines itself. Well, there was nothing there. And uh, I uh, was at a loss to know how I was going to live and do what. It's a great, it was a great sense of uncertainty. And I think all these periods have this are faced with this uncertainty. Well, what am I going to do? What is going to happen, you know? So one is delving into the future in, the, in that kind of way. Well, here, I was very fortunate. I met somebody and I got a job in Grindley's Bank and a good job at that. You know? So I was fortunate, would they? All my compatriots were not so fortunate. None of this, I may say, I, mean, I was very, very keen on painting and so on. But with this kind of uncertainty pregnant inside one and coming out and so on, there's no time to think of painting because painting, I think all creative activity requires a great deal of thought, silence, looking at it, discussions, and all. it's a world unto itself. And that when you're thinking about how you want to sell, just stay alive, this hardly takes place. The thing comes as a, as an image after afterwards. I painted pictures well after the event, after I was in Bombay, settled in a house and so on. And I was absolutely full of thoughts about what had happened. A lot, I lost a lot of friends. And more than that, you know, it was a total life living there and I lost all my friends there. And there were those Muslims and everybody else stayed they stayed there, they had, they suffered the same kind of thing as we did, you know. The paintings came much later. The pa and I think this is inevitable because a, pa a painting takes a long, it's just not brushed out. Uh, Satish, on the other hand, had, had practiced this in Mexico and worked with Mexican muralists and so on and been through the whole procedure. But I think he also did these pictures not during the partition at all. No, none of them. Brown Nath didn't. Uh, neither did um, uh, you know Satish. Uh, several, several of us. And then they came out in a gush, you see. And then it was then the partition was revamped as it was uh, through imagery which had inf inflicted us, in fact, and kept alive. And then came out uh, bits and pieces and more and more and more and more, you know, like that. And I think that in this situation today, again, there have been various breakdowns in the country, you know, floods have happened, rains have happened, wars have happened. I've been involved in each one of these in, in, in galvanizing people and art. I had an all India artist thing over the last one war with Pakistan, we had a, 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 a collected work from everybody. Anybody who wanted to sell could, could send it. And it was auctioned at Trimeni, Kala Sengu. Uh, the, the, the president was there, he saw it, he came and sat there and all the rest of it. And then uh, somebody who was in the army at that stage heard this over the, uh, he was not well and he got the, um, the, the TV, vision of this thing and he then called me up immediately and said would I be interested to collect some friends and go to the front and I said well I tried the very same evening I barely got home then I went to see Hussein I went to see Tayyab uh, and there was myself and Ram Kumar and we all lived in walking distance from each other 
and I was able to ring him the same night and say, yes, we'll go. So we went to Pakistan and then we met and we went around and pictures did come out. Pictures came out, writing came out. Uh, but I will say it didn't happen immediately. And the, the immediacy of art, actually art takes its own, own jolly time. I mean, it figures inside you all the time. You're burning up with it. But you don't have the time nor the energy, in fact, to galvanize it all into an image. And that comes much later. It's a recollection, in fact, of, of what you went through. We went through some pretty harrowing times during this, I might say. I won't go into it right now. But we did go into very harrowing times and images which were which you couldn't swallow, you know, can't even look at. I mean, the smell of the thing is still in my nostrils, if you can believe that, you know. Well, that was, that was how one fared, fared in, the, in, the, in, 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 in this kind of situation. And this situation, somewhat different for me. And it's all very different for everybody, in a sense, you know, in a certain class. And it's such, I mean, I'm in a class by myself, the artists are there and so forth and all. Some doing well, some not doing well, but nobody's on the streets. Here we have a situation when a large portion of our own people, I mean, they are my people, you know, I mean, this hurts me to see what is happening. The, but at 95, I can't kind of run around, frankly, quite honestly. And one would wish that one would, could, galvanize the same kind of spirit, the same kind of feelings. We could get a marvelous exhibition going, which would go off like a bomb. It may still happen because maybe those paintings are still on route, are being made and being done. And there's, there's no time, I mean, which is uh, fixed for this kind of thing ever. It happens. And all these things happen. They can't be, uh, you can't uh, prognosticate. You can't really lay down, you know, it can't be programmed at all. And art can't be programmed anyway. So even what comes out, so certainly, I mean, it has moved a lot of people, certainly moved me. But how it comes out and when it comes out depends on various factors, including what is mulling inside me the whole time, you know, on this thing, what to do. So Krishanji, thank you so much. And uh, we had prepared a little a kind of a slideshow by you know putting together a few images from all these, which we intended to show in the beginning of this discussion. With uh, everybody's permission, can we show it right now, Shuddha ji? Yes, and uh, maybe uh, whenever it's ready, we'll sh uh, share it with you. So in the meantime, I think Shuddha uh, or Shiva, would, Shiva, you would like to take over. Okay. Okay. Carry on then. Uh, I think it's really important to look at the kind of space and time that is between the actual experience of a terrible trauma and the creation of artworks which respond to that experience. I'm a child of uh, parents who uh, witnessed partition, same generation as Krishanji. I and I think while I grew up very aware of uh, this great cleavage of families, people, land, cultures, languages, uh, it was actually much later, perhaps in about 50 years after partition, yeah. that there was more talk, that partition was being discussed more publicly. There was a peculiar silence that yeah. seemed to only uh, be broken around the 50 years after the event. And I find this very interesting because perhaps it, the immediate response can only be the response of the photojournalist or the journalist. And these are very valuable records that we have a partition from Margaret Workwhite, from Sunil Jana. I think we'll see some of these images now, which, uh, but in a sense, the visual representation of that trauma uh, took some years for people like Krishan Khanna and that generation to, uh, to create works which responded to that experience. And then for the generation like mine, which grew up uh, as kind of inheriting partition as part of critical part of one's history, it was at a, that 50 year period that I think we started looking back at partition 
And I think this is not only in the visual arts, but there was a huge amount of research, of writing, of actually also attempts to reinscribe the story with new insights, particularly from a women's perspective, which had not really been included in earlier narratives. Uh, and around that time, I think there's also a reflection on the relationship between Pakistan and India. So looking back at partition is also looking at that relationship. So if I was to look at the 20 years or so, the last two decades from that 50 year period, um, I think we, there are several, several exhibitions, several events, several actions taken by contemporary visual artists that move beyond the recording of the trauma or the uh, relating to the archive and the representation of the trauma, but actually looking at what it means to live with this history. So there was a show, for example, called Shared History, Mapping Memories, done by Ayaka Puja Sood, which had artists from Pakistan and India, which traveled from Delhi to Lahore, and also Mumbai, I think it didn't make it to Karachi for whatever reasons. And these were attempts to actually build a conversation which was not only about us remembering this great cleavage, only from our perspective, but a shared perspective. A couple of other, I mean, there have been many, many kinds of um, conversations between visual artists on both sides of the border, which have continued that exploration. There's a fantastic project between, uh, I forget the exact name of the organizations, but basically visual artists based in Bombay and in Karachi, who did a kind of poster exchange when uh, flights were stopped in the countries, etc. And they're getting the names right now, but it was Huma and I think Shilpa. Uh, they call it Art Art. I think. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, they were also, this was also part of a number of peace initiatives uh, and a kind of new reinscribing of this story. Uh, while certain kinds of reinscriptions were taking place in this manner, there have been other reinscriptions that have been taking place which suit the nationalist purpose. So the story of partition has rapidly become a kind of currency something that is used by vested ideologies to further their own agendas. And I think it's very, very important that we keep a very careful eye on the representation of this historical event and this huge trauma uh, to see how this is actually being employed in a number of divisive discourses. There have been uh, other, I'm just going to mention a few that come to mind immediately. Uh, another very interesting exhibition, which was much later, like about 10 years after the uh, shared memories and the experiment that Huma and Shilpa Gupta did, uh, is Sadi Mahashmi, uh, the, uh, used to be at that time the head of the National College of Art in Lahore, who curated this wonderful exhibition in collaboration with the Devi Art Foundation called The Night Bitten Dawn, taking a line from her father's poem, uh, the poet Fez G. Uh, this exhibition also brought together artists from both sides and investigated the meanings of, uh, of that history. However, that the, in all this investigation and reflection, uh, I'm thinking back today, I find that the question of migration and the actual visual representation of that huge migration that takes place in 47 and across another period of another year, and then again uh, with the uh, creation of Bangladesh, there is not really, there is a kind of rendering of suffering. There's Chetto Prasad, there's Somnath Kaur, uh, amongst others um, that Divan has already mentioned, but there, is, there seems to be very little which actually directly engages with the question of migration. It is implied in the trauma and suffering that is explored. But uh, 
not there. Then more recently is a um, show uh, just a couple of years ago called Part Narratives, which included artists across generations from Krishan Kannaji to myself and younger artists as well. And this called part narratives sort of points to the fact that these narratives that we have partition are partial narratives and need to be continuously re-examined, revisited, as they are, they are becoming a kind of foundational myth for, uh, for a number of ideological forces at work in the country today. So to shift away from partition, which is actually a vast subject, and to focus on the migration aspect. Mm. Uh, what is happening is really curious. Those first images, mostly by Margaret Burke White, Sunil Jana, these are the authors, I know there may be others, seem to have been deeply inscribed into one's visual memory, because as I receive images today of workers on the street, it is almost like that image is revived. Of course, it's different, it's in color, etc., etc. It's a different time, it's contextually different, but something about that image evokes that historical image again. It's the people walking in distress with a small bundle of belongings, women, children, people dragging other people in carts. These recurring images have a curious mirroring a curious resonance with that great migration. I think I'll stop here because uh, we can then go into looking more at the current and contemporary situation in the next round. All right. Yeah, Shuddha. Thank you, um, Diwan, um, sir, for this invitation and this opportunity to have this dialogue. Um, and thank you both, Mr. Khanna and Shiba, for your interventions. Um, I'd like to take this one thing that Mr. Khanna said, which is to do with the feeling of uncertainty, um, this strange, tenuous feeling of not knowing what the future is going to be, uh, not knowing what the present is going to transform into. And I think that that's actually a condition that artists can be, artists, writers, poets, can be very sensitive to. Uh, it can become uh, pathological in other situations where it can become um, uh, an engine for, uh, for a kind of insular, depressive breaking down of the self. But it is possible, I'm not saying always, but it is possible, history has shown us, that the imagination responds to this uncertainty in a very productive way. Uh, earlier today, I was reading, uh, I occasionally sort of dip into the Granth Sahib, I, maybe because uh, we were going to talk with the Punjab Lalitkala Academy, I was thinking about the history of the Punjab and its resources. And there is a remarkable set of passages that Nanak uh, writes about, which is the Babarwani. And it's a time of great chaos and destruction. The Mughal armies are coming. They're being faced by the Sultan, the Lodi Sultans, and the people are caught in between and they're they perish and there's this tremendous suffering. And Nanak, uh, for being this, the spiritual seeker that he is, sort of turns an accusing finger at God and says that even you, do you not understand this suffering and this pain? Now, for me, that's really important because here is a person. No, thank, you for Nanji? thank you, Ranaya. Right, yeah. Um, who is a seeker, who transforms this moment of suffering into a statement that has almost cosmic proportions, that is a dialogue then between the self and the universe. For me, that's the work of the artist. There's a painting by Mr. Krishan Khanna, which has stayed with me from when I was very young, and it's called the Black Truck. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the back of a truck, and there's these huddled figures in yeah. darkness within that truck. And these past few days, even before you said that we would be having this conversation, that image has been coming back to my mind because I've seen these images of these people in these tankers and these trucks ferried across vast distances. Now, 
people are moving. They move during the partition. They move during the Bengal famine. They moved. They are moving now. They moved in 1971. We had 10 million refugees come across the border, and they were fed, housed, and looked after for a year. So when you have a government that says today, how can we deal with all these people walking on the roads? They're talking absolute garbage because if 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 a if the government and the society could find the resources to feed 10 million refugees in 1971, why can't that? Why can't even a fraction of that be? Which we are much better off in many ways can be mobilized. So people move not because they want to, but because they have to. And in all these situations, we are seeing people being pushed out of their homes, their workplaces, to take to the highways and the streets because they feel compelled. And it's a question of survival. <laughs> this time is something like both Shiba and Mr. Khanna have said, this force, this compulsion is something that will, I think, propel many amongst those who are artists and writers today to, to produce new work, to think like Nanak thinks about God and what destiny brings. It may also create a situation where many people who are not artists or writers today will become, because that is the only way in which they can deal with the excess and enormity of this time. So, I mean, paradoxically, this, this question of lockdown, of being locked into ourselves, of being alone and isolated, which we are all feeling, may also become the condition and the catalyst for a transformation. You may, f you may have a whole new generation of artists yeah. whom we've never yeah. heard of before. Yeah. I mean, I see this a lot. Yes, it takes time for artistic work to come. But I see the kind of memes that people make on the internet. There's a remarkable image that I saw a few days ago or a few weeks ago, there was this complete farce of getting the military to shower rose petals on hospitals. I mean, you could have had the army use its resources to help people move on the highways. Instead of that, they showered rose petals. I saw someone put on the internet within hours, a meme of people walking on the highway, a family, and yeah. rose petals being showered from a military helicopter. That person who did that, I don't even know who it is. I don't know if they are artists, but I can see that they have become artists in this time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, you are very brief, Shuddha. <laughs> Anyways, um, I was reading an article by Ramchandra Guha yesterday, in which he's talking something about China becoming a superpower or not, which he says will never be accepted by the world. And he was giving examples how uh, when Britain was in the 19th century, the superpower of the world, then America became, then Russia was trying to become somehow, and now China is. And the example he said that China can't become is when Britain brought the military and the economic power, along with that, Britain brought Shakespeare, Dickens, uh, or other things from the cultural things from, from Britain, which was so much acceptable to us. Similarly, when uh, America became a superpower along with its uh, military and economic power. America also brought with its Hollywood, its jazz, its blue jeans, and many other things which are so much acceptable to us, which we liked, even Coca-Cola. Even if, like, during the Vietnam War, he says, like, people hated America, but they liked those cultural things which America brought to us. Similarly, Russia, uh, pre-kind of communist era, writers and poets and all that great literature which they brought along with that power, which was acceptable to people, which China doesn't seem to have. So this is the power of culture, which, which in which it can really you know, bring people together, bridge the gap between communities, between you know, nations, and also maybe you know, uh, heal the wounds and also uh, become a catalyst, also become something which is uh, uh, maybe uh, which gives a direction to di directionless people when this, this kind of a catastrophe happens. We are all clueless. We are all, you know, kind of lost and we, we, we suffer so much. We are unable to think. And that's when the artist, a thinker, a writer or a poet or a filmmaker comes in, pitches in, which uh, at that time when people are despondent to kind of wake them up or hug them or provide them some kind of 
you know a sound or a visual or a, a word or you know or some some meaning uh, through all these cultural means which become so very important so i'll now come to my second question that also in fact uh, uh, before i come to that question will i now we are ready with that uh, slide show uh, should we have it now or should we have it at the end of the talk no i think you can have it now it will be a good uh, moment yeah. for people to yeah. sing a little bit that's great see what comes to my mind is uh, when uh, a country like india which is of course we know the population of india which is so huge and majority of this population lives in villages small towns small towns and most of them are not really at all connected with modern or contemporary art which all of us seem to be practicing now they are much more conversant with traditional folk and you know tribal art and but but what artists sitting in urban areas urban centers when they produce something does it really make any difference in their lives and does does culture really you know play this kind of a role in their lives and and by by sharing these thoughts and ideas like we know uh, when paris became a center of cultural activity along with all those great minds which converged into paris and then we have you know all the great things happening at that time how how do we kind of deal with this kind of a dichotomy when these millions of people who are migrating have no connection with what we are talking about and how does it kind of make a difference in their lives or in 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 the times we are living in in which way this this is this is something which comes to me are, are we are we relevant these contemporary and modern artists in these kind of times or we are as punjabi's famous poet surjit patra always talks about that poets listening to poets and artists watching artists exhibitions you know ke samundar pe mi barish pad rahi hai no ke rain pouring over see what does, what difference does it make so this is a question maybe maybe not uh, uh, appropriately framed we can we can maybe think about it someone amongst us maybe can try to answer it if i if i if i'm not really kind of uh, very clear <laughs> about it <laughs> you can take over anyone if you if you like to shuddha would you like to say something about it sure i mean i just spent a little time thinking about your evocation of uh, professor ramchandra guha and tying it to what you said i think we no longer live in a time where this discussion of who is going to be a superpower or not going to be a superpower it's not relevant anymore i mean even in this country people made this ridiculous claim that pehli january first january 2020 india would be a superpower we see uh -huh. where we are, where we are now right um we are living in a time where as i have said before and i calculated the total weight of the virus in grams that is besieging the world right now is something right now like 2 and 1/2 grams if there is a superpower on this planet right now it is a virus and we are all subject to its to its mutations right the locusts that have come uh, you know they are in the fields of haryana punjab rajasthan right now they are a superpower we are nothing compared to that right we are living in a civilization globally that prepared like india is and india and pakistan are countries that built um, in that invested enormous amounts of money on building nuclear weapons yeah. they did not build public health systems yeah. so the superpower of the virus is besieging both india and pakistan we can protect each other from our nuclear arsenals but not from the virus and when mr guha says that you know for instance when he says things like that china cannot become a superpower first of all i don't think anyone in china is even interested in becoming a superpower not even the political leadership in china thinks on those lines it's only people outside who project that anxiety onto the leaderships inside no political power in the world today can imagine itself realistically as a superpower that time is gone but even if we were to take the question of soft power and cultural power i think mr guha is remarkably ignorant of the enormous presence of chinese cultural goods in the world yeah. and by cultural goods i don't just mean of course they are much more present in terms of their contemporary art forms than 
let's say we in india are so mr goa doesn't even have an idea of the difference in level of the presence of contemporary culture from china and india but even you know what we are sitting and working with our phones our computers the material culture our slippers our buckets they all come from china this constitutes the cultural material of today's contemporary world so when he says you know there is no cultural power i don't think he knows what he's talking about this brings me to my to your second point do people the the awam the 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 arm lok do they have a sense of contemporaneity i have a feeling that we don't pay enough attention to their sense of contemporaneity i when because i have to travel a great deal in the world i used to take flights let's say from argentina or brazil or new zealand and in every flight there would be a peasant from the punjab who was going to prospect new lands i was i watched people and i would make strike up conversations ki pind kithe aayega ji batinda vich kahan ja rahe argentina kya karne khet dekhne yeah and this is not something new this movement this desire to and these were not rich people they were not landed people they were people who had put together their savings and they were out to explore the world like in a sense i keep coming back to nanak he was an explorer he was a world explorer yeah. in his time so their sense of international cosmopolitan contemporary culture is very strong in punjab in literature you have people yeah. i mean i said this earlier to you uh, that after the first world war when the spanish flu epidemic broke out one of the few and remarkable instances of its reflection in our literary cultures in south asia is in a long narrative ballad poem in punjabi called jangnama europe written by one sipahi nand singh who witnessed the spanish flu in flanders and in france and germany and then when he came back he said जंग तो खत्म हो गया लेकिन फिर बुखार आई द फीवर टुक अवे एज मेनी पीपल फास्टर देन द पुल ऑफ अ ट्रिगर नाउ यू विल इट विल बी वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू फाइंड इन कंटेम्पररी लिटरेचर ऑफ दैट टाइम ए रिफ्लेक्शन ऑन द स्पेनिश फ्लू इट एग्जिस्ट इट एग्जिस्ट इन द वर्क ऑफ निराला फॉर इंस्टेंस इन अ फ्यू अदर स्कैटर्ड सिचुएशन बट इट वॉज सर्टनली अ in the proverbs in the songs and in the in the stories that people told each other of the world yeah. i think you'll find i think we will find a similar situation today contemporary art is lucky because it does it can also speak in an idiom that is of the everyday it doesn't have to place itself on some exalted pedestal of high culture it can speak in a in a modus i mean i remember one of the first projects that really blew my mind was shiba chachi's work on um uh, our great film star um what's her name the, the yeah. lady meena kumari yes i remember her work on meena kumari because it was able to evoke something that was a part of the glue of everyday conversation we grew up with it so i think that we will find as time goes by seeds of contemporary culture woven deep into the subconsciousness of the popular imagination right now so if i may uh i think it's it's uh, i really appreciate what you said shubha and i want to add my appreciation and actually a great interest in the kind of memes stories narratives poetry songs that are emerging these are immediate responses there's also the phenomena of what i would call perhaps citizen photographers or citizen videographers where it's not just the photojournalists and the professional photographers but people using their mobile phones to record their situation sharing it uploading it on, on social media as well as like one particular journalist that i know about chinki sinha who has offered uh the possibility of sharing to a much wider audience uh to the migrants to the workers that she has met and so they send her small videos small clips photographs which she has then gathered together 
into a document where they are also speaking about their own situation and not just others describing their situation. So the, the kind of democratizing of the media today is an extraordinary and unprecedented possibility for this first response, for the immediate response. And I think we're already seeing it, whether we describe it as art or not, it really begs the question. I think it's an irrelevant question. However, I think there's a deeper, another layer. And it's a layer that perhaps will take time to mature. And this is the capacity of contemporary art practice because it is interdisciplinary, because it is conceptual, because it is research oriented to develop a deeper analytic. One of the things that this whole situation uh, has really underlined for me is the principle of interdependence. So whether we look at the virus and the link between destruction of wildlife like wildlife habitat, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, that entire chain, I'm not going into detail, there is considerable detail available on this, which produces the virus, the virus which then seeks human hosts and then transfers to multiple human hosts carrying infection and disease and misery. Whether there is that chain of interdependence, whether there is the fact that this is global, which simply makes even more visible and naked the fact that we are part of global supply chains, that we're part of a globally organized system, that the sort of system we inhabit today as human beings is marked by interdependence. And then to come to the city, the movement of workers, well, and you know, I think Shuta has raised this earlier and somewhere else, but that we continuously refer to the workers as migrants. Yes, they are people who left their situation of rural impoverishment to seek work in the city. They are workers. They are not migrants in the, in, in the sense that we use migration either in partition or uh, migrants in the sense that we describe the Syrians or the people fleeing conflict situations. And in the persistence uh, and the insistence on returning home, which has continued despite the fact that lockdown is eased and work is beginning, can be seen as a kind of resistance or a kind of refusal turning their back on a city, on a people, on a system which did not recognize their own, uh, their relations of interdependence with them. Mm. It has really laid bare the kinds of connections that actually produced this phenomena. So for me, a more reflective, more analytical and perhaps more critical thinking, uh, and this will take time, it's not something that is part of that immediate bearing witness, which is perhaps one of the first acts of visual representation or representation in any kind of art form or form of expression. I think the other layers will, will come and would need to look at the broader structures, at the systemic organizing, at the way this system works. And it is through that understanding of interdependence, for me this is a critical, critical concept, that a number of things that we wish to change, that we wish to see happen, that we wish to acknowledge, can appear. So to bring this, this, this understanding into public domain, this is an understanding that has been around for a long time. It is not esoteric at all. Uh, the kind of interdependence, uh, the kind of links between climate and the virus are things that the scientists have been talking about and the ecologists have been talking about for a long time. It is no surprise. The pandemic is not a surprise. It is the latest in a series of messages which are indicating that there is a huge issue in the system. So I think as artists, as creative thinkers, as people who have the great privilege of access to form, uh, we need to actually 
both introspect as well as look very carefully at the causes and conditions of what has produced this terrible suffering and this particular phenomenon. Uh, Krishanji, before you, I bring you in, I'll just clarify a little bit. Uh, a, a, a little personal incident which is reflective of this thing. Um, I, I went around the world, I showed and so on, and I went to Japan, I got interested in Sumi painting, but then discovered a methodology in painting and Sumi painting which has never been done, right? And this was wildly successful in America. I went there then, and I had a wonderful show. You know, the museums bought me, the people. I, I had every reason to be very happy with what I was doing. Gaitunde, my friend, was there in New York at the time. And he saw me change. And I have, has, this is a year later, I was showing at another gallery. And this is, uh, well, to call it, you know, by the obvious, it was figurative art, which is a stupid kind of a, a, a cap, you know, on a kind of art. He said to me, he said, Christian, you were doing so well as, as an artist there and as a painter doing wonderful work. Why do you now suddenly turn to this? You know? And I have one simple answer. And my answer is I have a lot more to say than just that. And give me the freedom to say it. And I'm saying it, you know. And I don't think, you see, that art, like, anything which is developed, which grows, which grows actually, uh, gets onto itself is a kind, with a kind of sophistication. It's, I'm not, not using that word, word in any pejorative sense at all. What I mean is it, it develops and the development is seen and is there. That's one aspect of art. But art has, and I think the greatest art has always had, it's multiple, it's huge. Every, ideally everybody could think that, yes, well, I can see this is mine, you know. And it could only be one particular thing that a person is putting his finger on. It's a multiple thing. And that multiplicity, you know, depends upon the individual, how he's been brought up, how he's looking at people, where he's worked, where he's lived, that, that black truck, which, which, which I did overnight, actually. And I did that in similar of all places. I was a small studio there and I went there and I did it way from Nizamuddin where trucks come in, this is their home. Trucks come there, people live on the, uh, on the trucks and under the trucks and so on. They assume the colors of whatever they're dealing with. You know, it, it's, it's, it's such a multiplicity of things which are together. And that is what interested me. What interests, interests me far more, in a sense, in a social sense, these trucks have been here for barely centuries, you know. They've been a long time there, and nobody's thought about them. Nobody, no artist has sort of painted trucks. And it's, it's a, the, the most common sight, which, 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 which compels, should compel some kind of interest within it, you know. Same thing with the band wallas. Bandwala, I mean, people think, you know, a bandwala chai. Now they want colorful pictures and so on. Actually, why I painted the bandwalas were also an exodus from Japan, Pakistan. And these guys only function, their only function was at the time of weddings, you know. Till then, they would be on their thing and then learn to play some tune or not a tune at all. And families would get together and go. And even the grandpa was sort of joined in. He can't leave him alone at home, you know. He's given a triangle. He says, he says, Babaji, this will be a little bit of a ting And you know, so it meant, and there's a humorous side to these things. There's a funny side. There's a whole life, life pattern, actually, which goes into it. And now to paint it in a very literal kind of business would be very stupid, actually, because the re reality is far better than anything one, one can paint. And paint has to talk, to, then you have to talk the language of paint. You've got to know what paint can do. And that takes a long time. And it can't be taught. It can be taught in the sense that I think the old Guru, guru uh, well, 
Shishya Parampara was the best. That's the only way you ever, ever get into the into 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 a particular matter of work. That's all. Uh, so Shuddha, uh, coming back to I, I refer to Guha only from the point of view of that culture is so important to, yes. to get them into your system. Not the power, the real no, no. power of military no. and army. So, so I was not in any way trying to no, uh, I understand. any superpower or anything. So I understand, but what I'm saying, what it points out to me, pardon me, is the way in which Indian intellectuals can be completely ignorant and unaware of contemporary art and culture. The, the fact that Professor Anubhati, that that. China has no cultural values to give to the world right now, shows us that he neither knows culture nor China. It's just, it's just, I mean, he's not alone. All the great intellectuals of our time have a studied ignorance. They know a few Hindi film references, yeah. but they're not really interested in the production of contemporary culture. They don't read beyond their native languages. Yeah. This is a problem with Indian intellectuals. It's just yeah. something we have to park and move on. Yeah. Artists are much better than this. They are much more curious about the world. If you ask any practicing artist today, "Bhai, Iran me kya hai contemporary art me, wo bata sakta hai. That's true. That's, That's true. true. I, I would leave it there because I, being the moderator, would not get into uh, oh. any 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 of this. Who is uh, less informed and who is more informed? You are probably. Uh, the right person to talk about it. So I, I would, uh, I, I'm thinking maybe we can take some questions also. We'll try to. Uh, so I, I welcome the viewers if they can uh, send some questions. And later on, uh, maybe uh, I had one thing more in mind. If uh, any one of you would like to answer, is uh, when we, when we uh, artists, as visual artists, when we do something, we, you know. Uh, we put together an installation or a visual um, kind of um, performance or a video performance or painting or drawing or whatever. And when we do an exhibition, we you know, have books published, we have articles appearing in newspapers. What kind of interest does it generate amongst those who are policy makers, like bureaucrats or politicians or yeah. lawmakers? And, and does it really impact their way, way of thinking? And later on, obviously, once laws are made and you know, policies are made, which do impact uh, millions and millions of people. And is it, it's, it's a very simple question. It may, may or not be asked, but I'm very curious to know that is, it, is there any direct relationship between that or is it like Money Calls Films, which we always talk about uh, is a great cinema, but it is meant for only those who are already informed. It's not meant for ordinary people, as many people say. So does art play this kind of a role, which kind of starts a discussion and a debate and some kind of a, an argument, which later on becomes a movement or it, it impacts a filmmaker or a thinker or a writer or a policymaker? Does it, does it play this kind of a role anyway? Would like to go first. So you say <laughs> this <for> the talk. <laughs> well, I have one very brief thing to say about this. Okay. I totally agree with you that uh, that large amounts of people, publics, are deprived of contact with contemporary art and culture. But I don't think that's because necessarily because of the way art and culture is produced. It has to do a lot. It has a lot to do with infrastructure. And a time of crisis like this when we are all isolated, is a good time to think about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one brief example. When Shiba is present. She did a remarkable institution, uh, installation in the Delhi Public Library some years ago. It was an installation that talked about climate. It talked about temperature. It talked about reading the world. And it was in this beautiful, amazing library. A very large number of people came to see that work, and they were not alienated from it. Mm -hmm. They did not ever say, Ki hame bhi samaj nahi aaya. Yeah. People, I think, live in a condition of wonder and bewilderment, which they are happy with. It's only 
some entitled individuals and here i mean policy makers and bureaucrats jinko samajh na aane se dikkat zyada hoti hai ye agar samajh nahi aaye to matlab bewakoof hai wo kharab hai ha ya fir wo kharab hai kharab hai ya relevant nahi hai aam logon se ke sath jab meri baat cheet hoti hai koi agar samajh nahi aati cheez to wo that's a spur for curiosity i spent a long time in that installation talking to a lot of people who use the delhi public library they use it because they come there to read newspapers children come there dating couples come there retired gentlemen come there because there's a cooler yeah. and they all went to engage with the work so as far as i am concerned policy makers ko bhul jao we have a class of people who run governmental institutions who are culturally illiterate they should not be our criterion our criterion should be the passion दिल्ली में किसी आम इंसान के साथ आप शायरी में बात कर सकते हैं अभी तक उर्दू में या पंजाबी में दिस इज नॉट एन अनकल्चर सोसाइटी वी हैव मे बी अ कल्चरली इलिटरेट रूलिंग क्लास बट दैट डज नॉट मीन दैट वी आर सराउंडेड सोशली सराउंडेड बाय पीपल बिरेफ्ट ऑफ क्यूरियोसिटी पैशन वंडर लव i totally agree with you on that shiva you have uh, something to add to it uh, absolutely i think it is about um the creating the possibilities of that encounter between contemporary art and a very wide range of people and the installation that shuta refers to is is closest and very dear to my heart precisely because it was able to build that conversation with a very very diverse set of people however i think it's important not to instrumentalize one's idea of art and say yeah. art raises this issue and this should have a direct impact on yeah people or on policy or etc etc i think there is um some kind of work that does do that very direct engagement it is usually often critical and um how should i say this it's it is aggressive in its intention to whatever it is seeking to argue about but one should not limit oneself to seeing this kind of direct instrumental relationship one should actually rather think of developing a broader understanding of uh, opening up dialogues and conversations building a uh, public consciousness Bring, bringing many more ideas and experiences and forms into the public domain and through that developing uh, a more um more informed uh, uh a kind of um discourse which then in its turn influences policy etc 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 uh these are slow processes and i think often invisible processes uh i started very much as a person who worked with ngos uh developing visual material and there it was very much about producing um images or audio visuals or posters that would give the message and i think that it succeeded to a certain amount to to some extent but it was extremely limited in terms of what it actually tried to do because it didn't open a conversation it told people things and i really moved away from that kind of work for more complex communication which is what art offered me so let us not make simplistic demands of a potentially complex conversation that is absolutely right and we have one question by somebody called daniel connell and we can we can carry on with our conversation in, in between we can take it's a very simple question it say he says uh, who consumes the image we see that's a very simple question that's the question you had who consumes the image yeah hmm. see like we have this very uh, we all know about it uh, uh, the, the immediate example in front of his kochi museum is biennale look at look at the number of people who who visit that biennale and the ordinary people ordinary means yes. they are all ordinary but people who 
obviously they seem not to be having any connection with art but they seem to be having a very deep connection with art and the way they consume it the way they love to you know explore and you know find out and sometimes uh, yes. art is not meant to be kind of literal in terms of you know uh, giving any literal explanations and something you have to kind of feel and imbibe and just uh, take it in and that's what a lot of people do and that's what art fair is although it's a gallery oriented kind of a thing i've not missed a single art fair in delhi but there two people go and buy tickets and watch and uh, kind of uh, try to engage with art so that way engagement as shuddha and uh, shiva said very rightly that people are not fools they are not illiterate not we think all. they are illiterate but the only thing is sometimes we have put into their mind ke aapko samajh nahi aa raha and and then they also try to say oh hame to samajh nahi aa raha if we don't ask this question ke aapko samajh aa raha hai ke nahi aa raha art can be felt art can be imbibed art can be taken in and what it does those shapes and colors and forms and you know various juxtapositions they do something there some part of the brain which which uh, which does it uh, i think uh, act as it supposed to be am i am i right sure so krishan ji would you like to say something well, I, i i i i entirely agree with you and i'm thinking of a, a personal thing that i have a we have one help in the house who does everything who does everything and even washes my brushes at the end of the day he comes down to the studio i i talk to him about my painting also and he is from jharkhand you know uh, obviously an illiterate he is not illiterate he, he i i i make him read my hindi things that come to me he he reads that for me you see so he is not illiterate he is in an intelligent fellow who wants to know there's a lot that's wanted the point is one mustn't give him the large chunk straight away you know because that might frighten him away you know the thing is you have to give him as much as you think he is capable of absorbing if you do that uh, then it grows from that you don't have to measure it but you sense it the a ये इतनी ये समझ आ जाएगी यू नो मैं गल कर लो यू नो सो इट गोस दैट वे आई मीन एंड हैपेंस इन एग्जिबिशंस एज़ वेल पीपल कम अप एंड आई थिंक वन ऑफ देम वाज हॉरर वन ऑफ देम वाज हॉरर थिंग्स आई थिंक इज दैट दे गेट फ्राइटेंड इफ दे हियर माय नेम आई एम सपोज बी अ फेमस नेम व्हेन आई हेट दैट वर्ड यू नो आई एम एन ऑर्डिनरी आई एम अ पेंटर फिनिश आउट and uh, I, that's that's what i live by that's what i painted that's my been my passion okay i communicate on that level and that's it you know and that seems to work all right i mean i i, mean, I don't want to be swaddled with people because that would give me no time to do my own work and, and my work requires a lot of time this now you know yeah i do i do I have an example and I, and i can't i can't throw it away in parties and things you know so i have to work and i'm working yeah i i know because i used to work for a for a company taking commercial photographs of that big factories and all that and once in the middle of the night we could not locate that uh, factory and we were coming from one location to the other yeah. and one of my assistants who was also my house help and we also you always used to make fun of him that he's an incomp we used to make strange faces that he doesn't understand much and uh -huh. we were lost and suddenly he says here it is i said how did you can't read a thing right in hindi uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. how did you find out that this is the factory he said that logo and he immediately recognize this is a factory that's the power of the visual and, and a person who we think is illiterate he can immediately correlate with it and coming back to our discussion uh, the topic of a discussion migration and if we, any of us has something to share uh, regarding the present uh, you know distress uh, through which although we have discussed it uh, with all of those uh, migrants are going through and uh, i know a whole lot of artistic community is equally distressed and they are equally worried and uh, and maybe sometimes helpless also and how, in which way uh, can we uh, can we approach this new phenomena and how can we participate or help or be of any kind of uh, purpose in this whole thing i'd like to share one thing if i may sure sure please so i have to share screen i know and 
this is what I wanted to share. It's an image. Um, it's by, uh, it's a painting by Auburn Indranath Tagore. It's called The Passing Away of Shah Jahan. It's a very famous painting. Uh, I first encountered it in the pages of a magazine, a Bengali popular magazine. So I didn't know if it was a painting, but it was part of the visual culture available in a very normal household. And I think that's one of the ways in which art actually enters conversations with people. Now I'm interested in this painting because uh, you can see it's Shah Jahan looking at the Taj Mahal. He's very sad. Next to him is a young woman. If you know the context of the story, it's his daughter, Jahanara or Roshanara. I don't remember which one. And um, it's, a, it's a death scene. Shah Jahan is about to die. Obanindranath Tagore said that he wrote, he made this painting as a response to his sadness on losing his daughter during the great Spanish flu epidemic. Oh. So for me, it's all it, knowing this backstory becomes a very interesting thing for me because it's an instance where it's a response to an epidemic that created this image. We don't really know that. People who have looked, consumed the image was one of the questions that came up, have looked at this image and thought about time, about sadness, about the passing away of life and so on and so forth. But, and that brings me back to Shiba's question. The work of art is not necessarily only to directly engage with an issue or a theme, but it becomes a source with which for us to think about things that we may not even be able to put in words well. What does it mean to lose to gradually lose weakening the weakening of bodily ties. When you hear people in the COVID-19 situation, because the patients are often kept in isolation, they cannot be with their families, right? That sense of separation at a moment when you actually, people want to be with each other, especially when they're dying. And I think that this painting for me is a means by which to think about that emotion. So art always plays that role in creating a space for wonder, for mystery, for not knowing what to say, for not being able to directly address things. And it may take time not just to make things, but it may also make, take time for people to, to arrive at new meanings for the art that they see. So I wanted to bring this up here because it is a hundred years ago, it's an epidemic, you know, Apparently, 40, 50 million people died of the Spanish flu in India. It's remarkably absent in our cultural consciousness. But there are traces of it if we start looking for this. So maybe that's a way in which to approach our time now. So I'll stop sharing it. Thank you. Krishanji, should we? Uh... Well, you know, I mean, uh, you look at a picture, for instance, uh, which you've never seen before. And what strikes you first is the, the body of the picture, the forms that have been put there. And the forms are necessary for particular things that had to be said. And you have to read it backwards. Uh, everybody may not be capable of reading it backwards. But little leads can be given into the painting. And then you leave it to the person, you know. Fikre harkas bakadre himmute ost. Everybody has uh, a certain limitation or an extension, and that has to be explored. You can't pump in knowledge like that. You, know, you can excite it, and then the rest is left the, for the person's imagination. And I think there's no harm in European aesthetic, of course, it is said, you know, it is thought that the painting or the work, the forms alone must speak and that's it. And the rest is garbage. We don't, it's got nothing to do with the painting as the painting was painted. I don't know if that's right or wrong. I think, I think it's wrong because it's there as a thing for people to look at and they're free to look at it the way they want to. They can discuss it. And then their opinions can also change. Or the person who's saying it, his opinions can also change, you know. So, but it's a living situation. That is the point. The, the work of art is not something just hangs there like a dodo, but uh, 
it should excite some kind of action, some thinking, some whatever, you know. And ultimately, you develop this way and methodology of looking, and uh, there's a certain line to be followed to, if you want to do that. Some people want to do more, some people want to do less. You can't dictate. You know. I think with that note, I think we've discussed quite a lot of issues. And we've now done, I think, almost one hour, seven, eight minutes. Uh, but we started a bit late. And uh, uh, some of the issues, of course, uh, are not discussed. And we, maybe we can have another webinar or another. We'll never know what is going to, what is going to happen. That's true. And uh, with that, I think we let's bring this discussion to an end. I hope that um, our viewers have uh, uh, somehow benefited from our thoughts. And maybe, maybe we can... Uh, they can send us questions later at plkapunjab.gmail.com uh, gmail.com and we can probably try to, if technology allows us to include them uh, into our live stream video, which is uh, live on that. And maybe later on, we can find answers if we can somehow, if some of us can uh, uh, by, by sending you know, responses by email. Uh, and thank you all of our viewers and once again, our apologies and we hope that we come out of this pandemic as soon as possible, then millions of people the world over do not have to suffer the way they are suffering, especially in a country like India, which has huge, huge, huge population and millions of people who have no access to food, to resources, to places like that. I, 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 I really end with this note that uh, from the migrations comes to me when I read uh, uh, an interview by some journalists, a brief interview taken by of of a migrant from Ludhiana. And they were asking now, since the factories are opening in Ludhiana, why are you going back to you know, Bihar or UP, wherever you are? He said, Ab humko agar marna hai, to hume apne mein, apne ghar mein ja ke marna hai. Ab, apne ki mein apni chita hai. This is the kind of fear which this kind of pandemic or the situation or the management has created. And we hope that uh, better sense prevails and people do not really have to suffer as much. And God knows in future uh, how many migrations or forced you know, dislocations are going to take place. And with this hope that it doesn't happen again and we find some solutions to that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, viewers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.